Well, thank you very much. Um, I think as a species, uh, human beings spend a lot of time uh, thinking about themselves in the future and trying to predict the future. Um, I did a programme for the BBC all about uh, consciousness and they got me to do an experiment where every now and again I would get this little buzzer and I would have to record what I was thinking at that particular time. What was I using my brain for? Um, and it was remarkable. About 80% of the time I was actually thinking about myself in the future, trying to work out what was going to happen next. Um, and it's interesting that uh, how many other species on the planet actually have a sense of consciousness? Of course, we're not very sure because consciousness is quite a complicated uh, kind of idea. We're not even sure quite how to define it. But it's believed that there are two other species which pass a very rigorous test, something called the self, uh, mirror self-recognition test. Who can recognise themselves in the mirror and say, that is me? Um, orangutans and chimpanzees also believe to be, uh, have a, a similar level of consciousness to us. But what's interesting is that chimpanzees lose this ability to recognise themselves in the mirror and look into the future um, 15 years before they die, because there's a heavy cost about looking into the future, which is, of course, we're very aware of our own death. Um, so it seems like chimpanzees actually give up on this um, ability to have a sense of self, perhaps, because it's uh, uh, just a little bit too dangerous. But I think that there's one tool that we've developed as a species which has become very powerful in enabling us to make predictions into the future. And I think our brains, many people when I talk to say they're, they're not mathematicians, they don't like maths, but actually I think our brains have evolved very mathematically because mathematics is an amazing tool to be able to take data up to this point and to read things into the future. It's intriguing, when I'm at a party and, and people ask me, okay, what do you do? I kind of slightly enjoy and dread this question because when I say I'm a mathematician there's this kind of look of dread that comes over uh, the person's face and very often their glass suddenly becomes very empty and they sort of flee to the other side of the party but but I'm very persistent so I run after them and I kind of explain to them that no no, no actually mathematicians do something quite interesting and when I push them I, I get this feeling that actually they think that as a mathematician a research mathematician at Oxford what on earth am I doing um, I think most people think I must be doing sort of long division to a lot of decimal places, and that surely I've been put out of a job by a computer by now. Um, but actually, I try to tell them that a mathematician is something very different from that. A mathematician, for me, I would define as a pattern searcher. That we, we study the science of patterns. We try to read the kind of chaotic, messy world that we have around us, and we try to find the patterns in there. And those patterns are the things that can help us to read into the future and perhaps plan and make predictions to, be, you know, to our own evolutionary advantage. So what I want to do in this session is to just illustrate some of the tools that I use as a mathematician. I'm not a technical analyst, but I think that the tools that I use are absolutely instrumental into to the, your sort of domain, where, of course, you're looking at a lot of data and trying to read things to your advantage, evolutionary advantage, into the future. Uh, but what I want to do is to show you where we can do things quite powerfully, where there are limitations, and where sometimes you just have to throw up your hands and say, we don't know. So let's start with a, a little bit of just warming up your pattern searching skills. So I'm just going to give you a few um, sort of exercises just to see whether you can read these patterns into the future. Um, some of them will be a little easy and some will be starting to stretch you. So um, here, here are the sequences that I want you to look at. Um, so the first sequence, um, can you read the pattern in the first sequence? So 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. So what's the next number in that sequence? 36. And how did you get 36? Yeah, you're just adding, you're adding um, the next number onto these things. So these are a very um, a simple set of numbers. They're called the triangular numbers. You can view them very geometrically. And this is very often a powerful tool for a mathematician if you want to understand how these numbers work, um, how anything works. If you can change the language, sometimes that becomes a very important tool. So if I want to, for example, get a formula, which will just an algorithm, which will tell me everything about these numbers, well, the one way to produce an algorithm is to change these into to geometry, change numbers into geometry. If I've got two triangles, I can put them together to make a rectangle. Counting things in a rectangle is easy. It's just the product of the two sides. And so I come up very, very quickly with a formula which can tell me pretty much anything I want to know about the triangular numbers. So, for example, if I want to know the hundredth triangular number, I could do the dirty way is to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. 
But actually, mathematicians are rubbish at mental arithmetic. I'm bound to make a mistake on the way. And we're also very lazy at heart. I mean, I think that's why I chose mathematics as a subject, is because if you understand the underlying pattern, it's a very fast way to getting uh, an understanding of the whole uh, subject. So if I want to find the hundredth triangular number, I can easily use this formula to decode that sequence. Well, the next sequence, of course, has already been mentioned. Um, uh, it's one you're probably very familiar with. If you've read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, it's the first sequence you have to crack in that book. So what's the next number in this sequence? 34, of course, these are the Fibonacci numbers. So you get the next number um, in the sequence by adding the two previous numbers together. Um, and it's already been said that these are very much to do with the natural world. Why? Because they have this natural sense of growth embedded inside them. The algorithm for generating these numbers are you take the two previous numbers and that's the knowledge you have in order to grow the next number in the sequence. And this is why this sense of growth naturally embedded in the definition of these numbers is why you find them all over the natural world. They're somehow nature's favorite numbers. So for example, if you take a flower and you count the number of petals on that flower, then invariably it's a number in the Fibonacci sequence. And if it isn't a number in the Fibonacci sequence, that's because a petal has fallen off your flower, uh, which is how mathematicians get round exceptions. Um, now, uh, this sequence as well, it's interesting that um, it was already, Deborah mentioned that um, it's already uh, been picked up by artists and architects. Le Corbusier loved these set of numbers in order to create buildings with a natural sense of growth that we will respond to in a building. In fact, these numbers shouldn't be called the Fibonacci numbers at all. They weren't discovered by Fibonacci, first of all. Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician who discovered them to do with nature, the way that um, populations grow from one generation to the next, um, uh, 12th, 13th century. But these numbers had already been discovered, actually, in India. Not by mathematicians or scientists, but by poets and musicians. Because actually, these numbers help you to count the number of rhythms that are possible if you have long and short beats. So, for example, if you've got four short beat, four beats in a bar, how many different rhythms can I make? Well, I can make uh, a rhythm with four short beats, or I could do long beats, two long beats. So that's two rhythms. Or I could go short, short, long, or short, long, short, or long, short, short. And that's it. I've got five different rhythms that I can make with long and short beats. Um, so these uh, Indian musicians and poets are kind of intrigued. OK, but I want to know how many are there possible with eight beats or 16 beats. Um, and what they discovered was this uh, simple trick of adding the two previous numbers together helps you to understand how many rhythms you'll get. and actually gives you an algorithm for generating all of those rhythms. Um, because you take uh, the ones with uh, uh, the, the rhythms before and add a short beat to that, or the rhythms before that and add a long beat to that, and you've got all of them. So that's often what we want. We want to find algorithms which can just simply, without much thought, generate everything that's going to follow on from our, after that. Now, it's intriguing, of course, that these numbers, because they're to do with growth and about information that you've got already generating what's going to happen next, that they've also been uh, uh, noticed to have perhaps some connection to the markets. Now, I think we're going to hear a little bit later on about how and whether there is any validity to the way that these numbers um, uh, actually respond to, to the markets at all. We actually do have a, a formula for these numbers as well. So, for example, if you want to push this uh, up into the hundredth Fibonacci number, the thousandth Fibonacci number, we have a formula, the triangular numbers, we had one for that. But this formula is a little bit more complicated, and it involves this kind of magic ratio called the golden ratio, uh, which has already been mentioned. It's one of the things we've, this kind of ratio of a rectangle. If you go to one of the galleries here in London, very often the canvases, the ones that you'll find most aesthetically pleasing, the ones you're drawn to, are those which are in this special ratio called the golden ratio. And so we can take powers of this number, the golden ratio, to give us access to these numbers. But there's still a lot of mysteries about these numbers, things we don't understand about them, which this formula doesn't help us to give, get access to. OK, so um, you're doing very well so far. How about the next sequence? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Now, it's interesting. 32 is said here, but somebody said 35. 35. Now, tell me why 35 would be the next number in this sequence. Because 32, I'm sure most people are saying, OK, this is just doubling. 32 is the... 25. All right. So how did you get 25? Square. Okay, so 2 isn't a square. Yeah, exactly. 2 isn't a square. 8 isn't a square either. 
That's, that's, that's true. So you, there are some squares inside there. So maybe it's squares and... But yeah, so your, your, your so algorithm is broken down, unfortunately. So 32 seems the most obvious answer, doesn't it? Because it seems like doubling. But let me explain to you why 31... I was interested whether you were going to come up with an algorithm. Because my, my point here is that very often there is other ways that a set of numbers can go which may not be as obvious as you think, but have as much credibility to them. So 31 is absolutely a, a credible answer to the next number in this sequence. Why? Because these numbers can be used to count something in mathematics we call the circle division numbers. So what are the circle division numbers? The circle division numbers, if I take a circle and I put a point on that circle, well, I've just got one region, the big circle, but let's put another point on there and join the points up. Well, now I've got two regions, okay? So two regions, put another dot on there, join all the dots up, and what do you get? You get this little triangle. So there's one region in the middle, three around the outside. So you've got four regions. So you think, okay, I, I'm starting to see what's going on here. I'll add another dot. And sure enough, you add another dot, and you get this little kind of envelope shape, uh, four triangles in the middle, uh, four little circle, uh, semi, uh, partial circles around the outside, eight regions. So you think, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the idea here. And you, you add another dot, and sure enough, the pattern continues. It seems to be doubling. Um, add a fifth dot, join them all up. You have five-pointed star, the pentagon in the middle. Um, you think, okay, well, it's 16. So sure, uh, now you're pretty certain. You've got so much data now that, um, you know, I, I think you would be justified in thinking that the next step is somehow it's doubling. And you've got to explain why putting another point is going to double the number of regions. But you get a surprise. Because when you add a sixth dot, and you can try this afterwards, the maximum number of regions you'll get is 31. You can't squeeze any more out of that. And so it isn't doubling that's at the heart of the way that this thing is growing. And actually, this is what makes mathematics fun, I think, is that uh, if mathematics and life were too predictable, it'd be boring. But what's exciting is coming up with something like this, where there's a sudden turn and the thing goes off in a new direction. But the key is, can we understand the algorithm behind this? What is it? It's not doubling. It might have been a reason. You put a point and somehow you just halve every region there and you'll get doubling. But no, there's another formula which is responsible for the number of regions here. And it's a slightly more complicated formula. This is a quartic polynomial. So you take the number of points on the circle, raise it to the power 4, do a little bit more of a polynomial, and this is the formula that will give you total knowledge about the number of regions. Now, of course, this is quite important. Um, this might be, um, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've got some sort of network and you're trying to partition the network up and you want to know how many different regions you're going to be able to generate, you're going to need to know that it isn't doubling because doubling will give you far more than this polynomial. Polynomial growth is actually quite slow and isn't going to give you very much. So here's a warning, and I think it's a very important one, especially when you're trying to read the future, is that you might have a pattern which has established itself, and it may seem to have an obvious direction that it's going to go in, but that may not be the algorithm that's at work. So just be careful with spotting patterns, because actually there's a theorem of Alan Turing's which shows that actually we could have come up with another algorithm which had given 25 as the next number in this sequence as well. In fact, Alan Turing showed that any finite number of pieces of data, you can give a reason, a mathematical reason, a mathematical equation why any number you choose will be the next number in this sequence. But then again, it's about, well, what is the most natural way? And of course, the most natural way was doubling for this, but one just has to be careful. OK, well, you're doing pretty well. Here's a more challenging sequence. So 2, 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. Suddenly the room's gone very quiet. Uh, how many people have you got here with a maths degree? Anyone? You've probably, uh, a few here? Uh, you've probably been holding back up till now, which is fair enough, because you know these sequences already, but you're allowed to play now, so... Um, 23. 23. Well, well, it is one of my favourite numbers, uh, the number that David Beckham played for in uh, Real Madrid. So, um, but no, 23 will be relevant to the next sequence. But um, uh, no, it's actually 26. Um, but if any of you could have got 26 uh, as the next number in this sequence, um, I would have been very impressed because these were the lottery ticket winnings for the 28th of September. Um, so another warning here. You have to pick your battles carefully when you're trying to look for patterns because not everything has a pattern in it. You know, I, I, don't, I have formulas for all of the others up till now, 
But I don't have a formula for this one. If I did, I assure you, I wouldn't be here now. I'd be on my tropical island enjoying myself. But um, uh, so, so a, a warning here, not everything has patterns, but I will illustrate a little bit later on how even something which is random, we can use mathematics to, to help us to navigate. Okay, what about the last sequence? Two, uh, two three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen. 11, 13, 17, 19. Now, sir, you can play, because 23 is the next number in this sequence. Um, uh, what are these numbers? The prime numbers, exactly. Um, so these are uh, actually probably the most important numbers to me as a mathematician. So a prime number, if you remember, is a number which is only divisible by itself and one. And so the next uh, indivisible number is 23, and then you get another quite big gap to 29, then 31. Um, but actually, as a research mathematician, this is a sequence of numbers that I spend most of my life trying to understand. Trying to understand a pattern in these is one of the biggest challenges on our books. And what's very striking is this sequence of numbers is probably the most important to the whole of mathematics, because they really are the building blocks of the whole of our subject. If I take a, a number like 105, then clearly that isn't a prime number. I can divide it by 5, then go down to 21 times 5. 21 isn't prime, I can pull that apart to 3 times 7 times 5. But now I've got down to these indivisible numbers. I can't divide these any further. And this is what's striking. These are why these numbers are probably the most important to anybody who's looking at uh, a, a subject like mathematics, because they're literally the, the, the atoms of arithmetic. Uh, if, if you look at the subject of chemistry, the most important discovery in chemistry was the periodic table. It listed all the building blocks from which you can make, make the molecular world. So for me, the primes, two, three, five, seven, are a little bit like the, the hydrogen, the lithium, the oxygen, the sodium of the world of mathematics. They're what build all other numbers. So, for example, I want you, uh, when you go away from here, to take your telephone number. Your telephone number will be a number which is either already indivisible, it will already be prime, in which case I'm incredibly envious because I've always wanted a prime number telephone number, but um, I still haven't got one, so I'll do swaps if with you afterwards. Or it's not, and you can keep on dividing, dividing, dividing until you get down to the basic numbers from which these are built. Now, what's intriguing is how important might these be um, if you understand these numbers to, to any, any game which involves numbers and data. Quite often, because these are the building blocks, you will find um, a knowledge of these numbers might help you um, through a, a particular problem, and it might be at its heart. But we really don't understand these numbers at all. We know that since the ancient Greeks, one of the greatest theorems perhaps the first theorem of mathematics, um, the ancient Greeks proved that there are infinitely many of these numbers. They go on forever. So actually, the chemists, they, they can put their periodic table on a wall. We can't. You know, if we were trying to write all the primes out, we'd be going on forever. Um, but we don't understand these numbers at all. This is the biggest prime number we have so far discovered. I don't have a formula which will help me to generate um, primes any bigger than this. Um, so this is, it's quite a big number, 2 to the power of 57,885,161 minus 1. And this is a special prime named after a French mathematician, mathematician called Marin Merzen, who was actually a, a priest during Fermat's time. Um, and this uh, has over 17 uh, million digits. That's a, that's a very big number. If I read all of those digits out aloud, we'd be here for two months, probably. So, uh, so, uh, but, um, but we know, actually, there are prime numbers that are, are, are bigger than this number. So they go on uh, forever, but we don't understand a pattern. We don't understand these numbers, and a lot of the time that's spent as research mathematicians, we're trying to sort of uh, become the Mendeleev of uh, mathematics. Nobody has understood the sort of patterns that Mendeleev understood in the atoms, which allowed him to produce that table with these sort of patterns of eight um, in, in the table. We don't understand these at all. In fact, there's much more feeling that there's a connection between the prime numbers and the lottery ticket numbers than the, between the primes and, say, the Fibonacci and triangular numbers. If you look at the primes as they're laid out, they seem to have embedded in them a, a sense of randomness. Now, of course, they aren't random, because a, a number is either prime or it isn't. But using, actually, that they might have a quality of being random, we can make a lot of predictions, actually, about 
properties of primes, how close they should be. Um, for example, uh, uh, prime numbers, uh, we have this thing called the twin primes conjecture. So um, primes often come in pairs, 17 and 19, 41 and 43. These are called twin primes. I actually have two twin daughters, um, and I tried to call them 41 and 43, but uh, my wife wouldn't let me, so um, that's my secret names for them. Um, uh, but uh, actually being able to predict how often we'll see these twins occur Occurring, if we apply a random model, which seems crazy to a set which is so deterministic, we can actually make a lot of predictions about how often we should see those twins occurring. And that's the intriguing thing, because even when something is random, even something like the lottery, we've actually developed incredibly powerful mathematical tools to be able to navigate even things which are random. So I'm going to do a little experiment just to illustrate uh, the power of mathematics to tell you um, things about uh, something which at first sight looks like in the lap of the gods. I mean, up till about uh, 17th uh, century, uh, things which are random were regarded as way out of anything that mathematicians could say anything about. But then we had people like Pascal and Fermat who came on the scene and said, no, actually, we can mathematize even something which is random. So you've got your um, little lottery ticket. So I'm just going to run a little experiment uh, uh, to produce some data. So if you could um, choose six numbers. So the National Lottery um, in England, um, we have to choose six numbers um, between uh, the numbers uh, 1 and 49. Um, so if you could uh, choose... Uh, a selection of your favorite six numbers, um, and then we'll run a little lottery. Um, there's, there's no big prizes, I'm afraid, just the honor. It, it, if, if you're going to choose the right six numbers, do it on the real lottery. I wouldn't waste your time on this one. But, um. Good, so um, if uh, you've, you've circled your six numbers, perhaps you've got a nice algorithm that you use uh, to generate your numbers, and then I'm going to get uh, somebody to uh, uh, let us um, pick some numbers. OK, so I'm going to come down here. Um, so if you could pick a number out for me, sir. Number 11. Excellent. A prime number. I, uh, I like him already. So. My birthday. It's your birthday as well. There you go. Number four. Power of a prime. And we've got number 44. A prime. 19. And 19. Excellent. Good. So let's... Uh, Sort these out, um, and you can see no whoops there. So nobody, uh, I think probably we haven't got a, anyone getting. So we've got 4, 11, 19, 21, 37, and 44. Great. Now, I'm going to use some mathematics to make some predictions about the numbers that you've chosen. So if you could um, wave your lottery tickets in the air. So I've got a sense of all of the lottery tickets. And I'm going to try and sort you out. So um, that's good. Yep. Good bit of waving, get your blood going. It's always this time in the morning when I'm starting to feel a bit sleepy. Um, OK, so I'm going to predict. Just keep them floating in the air. Good, that's good. I'm going to predict that half of you didn't get any numbers right at all. So put your paper down um, if you didn't get one number right at all. But if you've got a number right, keep on shaking excitedly. Yes, I got one number right. OK, so um, I would say that's pretty much half, although it's probably a little less than half. Perhaps you're a bit of an unlucky bunch. That's not a good sign. Um, OK, so what about um, two numbers right? So put your paper down if you only got one number right. There's about roughly 200 of you here, so I would expect 25. Um, so one in eight should be getting two or more numbers right. So if you could, uh, if you've got, uh, so that looks at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. OK, not too bad, 22. So, but now if I'm going to sort you out, if you've got three numbers right, keep shaking. So there should be about probably three or four that got three numbers right. So yeah, we've got, um, so stick up, yeah, great. I've got one, two, three that have got four numbers right. So th three numbers right. So the mathematics is, is pretty, uh, I mean, you're quite a small data set, obviously. Um, but already, that mathematics with a, a small data set is being pretty robust. Now, I would suggest that probably none of you got four numbers right. Oh, there is one here. So, so very lucky person here. So, so there's a one in a thousand chance. So if I've got a thousand, so, so this is a, a little bit of an outlier, maybe in a, in a uh, room of 200. But I would say it, I'm pretty certain that you've not got five numbers right. You've already put it down in, in anticipation 
participation, yeah? I, I mean, IFTA will have to grow to a huge mega conference, I think, by the time. If, we, if we've got 55,000 delegates, maybe next year, um, th then, uh, then I would expect uh, one of you may have five numbers right. And of course, six numbers, um, well, the, the chance of winning the National Lottery in England is a one in a 14 million chance. So um, uh, that's a, uh, no, no real chance there. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, obviously we'd love IFTA to be that big, that we'll get 14 million people along. But um, um, so one of the troubles with probability is that we, we were actually evolutionarily developed to be very good at pattern searching. So actually, I think we're quite mathematically um, built as human beings. But one thing we're incredibly bad at is having any intuition about large numbers and probability. And this is one of the reasons why I think probability and trying to assess things is incredibly counterintuitive. It isn't something that we're very good at because we're not usually exposed to anything with large numbers involved. We very, as a, uh, a species, we associate with a certain number of people and, and, and navigating things in the region of a million. A million, for most people, is um, infinite. I mean, if you say a million, a billion, a trillion, um, well, that's a one in a million chance sounds like you're saying something's uh, just highly unlikely. But, you know, there's a one in a million chance that somebody has a DNA match for a crime in, in uh, um, London. Well, we've got 10 million people here. So you pull one person out, well, there's another nine people who could have had that match. So actually, it's only a one in 10 chance that you've got the right person. Suddenly, that's collapsed as a, a probability. And I think it is this this fact that we don't actually navigate large numbers, that we, we really have a, a bad time trying to assess this. So, I mean, just to give you some sense of the scale of these numbers, um, uh, you know, if, if we were buying a lottery ticket every week, how, how long would we need to sort of um, win? I think you win, 20, uh, you win uh, 10 pounds if you get three numbers right or something. So, so, well, that would take you about a year of buying a lottery ticket every week to get three numbers right. Well, it would take 20 years to get four numbers right, uh, buying at one ticket a week. Five numbers, well, how far have you got to go back there? Well, uh, King Alfred. If King Alfred had started buying lottery tickets, you've got to go as far back as that. One a week, he would have got five numbers probably right by now. But what about six numbers? Well, if the first, my calculations go that if the first Homo sapien, the first thought that he or she had was, I must go buy lottery tickets. And he started, or she started buying lottery tickets once a week. Then by now, 14 million, um, they, they might have had one win in all of that time. So that gives one a sense of the scale of these numbers. But there's a kind of reasonable progression here. I think people feel like, yeah, of course, it's getting rarer and rarer. But what's intriguing is that um, uh, sometimes unexpected things happen that mathematics can help us to understand. So, for example, something rather weird happened in the ninth week of the National Lottery when it was started here in the UK. Because um, in the ninth week of the National Lottery, a huge number of people won the whole jackpot. 133 people chose the right six numbers. Now this was, uh, I mean, people were getting a bit worried if the ninth week of the National Lottery already had been wiped out. I mean, actually, how disappointing, you know, you, you're sitting on your settee at home marking off numbers and um, six come up and you think, woohoo, I'm a millionaire, and you phone up. And you find you've got to share the millions with another 132 people. And actually, they only walked away with 100,000 each. So, some, but what happened that week? What, it, was it you know, a lot of uh, employees of the National Lottery playing that week who had some uh, you know, uh, uh, future knowledge? Um, no, actually, what happened this week is a, an illustration of how bad humans are at being random. We are so mathematicians at heart that we leave patterns wherever we go. So when somebody's choosing a set of numbers, they are just leaving patterns behind them. And this is something that is very important to take advantage of, I think, is that actually humans are extremely bad at being random. Because what happened that week is that when they circled their numbers, People like to space their numbers out nicely because they think randomness sort of, oh, a bit there, a bit here, a bit there. Um, and that week, actually, the numbers were quite nicely spaced out. And so this tendency for the herd to go towards numbers which they think they're choosing randomly but actually have structure in them, that they're spacing them out, meant that that week, when it comes up, suddenly they're, they're, a lot of them are getting it right. Uh, intriguingly, uh, could you put your piece of paper up in the air if you chose two consecutive numbers? So if you chose something like 17, 18, 20, 21, 
Now, th this is pretty fantastic, actually, because quite a lot of you are putting your papers in the hands, so uh, in the air. Um, but actually, this is still less than I would expect from a truly random sequence, because mathematically, we can analyze, so you can put your papers down. There should have been half the room. Half the room should have put their hands up in the air, because mathematically, we can understand that half of the possible numbers that come out of this box will have two consecutive numbers in them which I think is something pretty counterintuitive, and people don't like to clump their numbers together. The numbers we got this time uh, didn't have any. They were actually quite nicely spaced out. We, um, but if we ran this again, there's a 50-50 chance, um, through the mathematical analysis of what's coming out of here, that I'll get two consecutive numbers together. And indeed, if we look at the previous week, the eighth week, and the tenth week of the National Lottery, um, then we do see this clumping, 21 and 22, and 30 and 31. And this is uh, something... Look, mathematically, we can understand in randomness that, yes, we will expect to get this clumping. Of course, if anyone came today on a bus, they would have been waiting for ages, and then suddenly three come along together. And this is actually an example of randomness at heart. <coughs> now, um, could you put your paper in the air, anyone who chose the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Fantastic. Look at that. So many are putting that. These are the true mathematicians in the room, I would say, because these people understand that, ha, ah, one, two, three, four, five, six is as likely as anything else to happen, i.e., unlikely. So, uh, uh, what, why did you choose one, two, three, four, five? No, no, I thought you said one of them. One of the numbers. No, no. I oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Now, I want to put your. Uh, so, let me rephrase that then. Um, this person chose one of one, two. If you, all of your six numbers were the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, could you put them in the air? Oh, yes, that did sort it out. Okay, thank you for that qualification. Okay, now I've only got... I thought, wow, you are a really great lot. I mean, uh, but you're still a great lot. But, um, uh, but intriguingly, actually only three people put their hands up right at the back. Um, and uh, I think this is illustrative of the fact that, you know, these people realise, well, one, two, three, four, five, six is as likely as anything else coming out of here. But still, we have a, a sort of a psychological tendency to avoid doing that. Actually, I would suggest that you do avoid doing that because in the National Lottery in England, amazingly, 10,000 people a week choose the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, which I think shows how intelligent the UK population actually is, that they know this is as unlikely as anything else. Um, but don't choose those because, of course, you'll have to share the millions um, with another uh, 10 million people, or 10,000 people. So um, not a good choice of numbers. But actually, this is a good strategy in some sense, if you, uh, you, know, if you want to advise anybody if they're choosing lottery ticket numbers. But you know, this applies to anything which has randomness in it. If you want to actually go against the tide, against the the, what most people will be doing, which, of course, what you're looking for is that sort of uh, arbitrage opportunity to, to take something uh, that most people won't be doing, is to know about these kind of things, to know when something is, that is counterintuitive is as likely as anything else, and then you've got an opportunity. So, you know, I always advise my friends, uh, uh, I never play the lottery because I like very predictable things, um, uh, being a mathematician, but uh, I always advise them to clump your numbers together, but just don't clump them like this. So um, choose some, some pairs or threes together. And then if you win, which is highly unlikely, um, at least you'll be taking the whole winnings home with you, probably. So. Uh, now, so probability uh, obviously is something which is involved in the markets. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about it um, this afternoon in the panel session um, about trying to deal with uncertainty uh, and how the tools of probability are very much at the heart of doing that. Um, but there's another very interesting region of mathematics which developed in the 20th century, um, which is totally deterministic but yet still has a quality of randomness about it. And it's a very important one, I think, to understand in any sort of system that you're looking at, um, which is chaos theory. Now, chaos theory is actually invented or discovered by um, a French mathematician called Henri Poincaré. And he was considering um, a, a very interesting problem. Uh, it seems, in some sense, uh, a problem that science should be able to deal with, which is, um, is our solar system stable? That seems pretty stable. You know, we had a, a, a lunar eclipse uh, two nights ago. We were able to predict that over America, you will be able to see uh, the moon suddenly disappear. We seem to have a lot of knowledge about what the planets are going to do in the future. Um, uh, but how certain can we be that the system that we've got will remain stable and just tick like clockwork um, uh, until the end of time? 
Well, we, we know that actually, um, if you take uh, two bodies, so for example, Newton showed, using the law of gravity, that if you've got two bodies in the sky, they will just do ellipses around each other till the end of time. But Newton couldn't solve it if you put another planet inside there. If you've got three of them, it just the, the mathematics started to get too complex, even for Newton. And actually, um, the king of Sweden uh, offered a prize at the turn of the century for any mathematician who could prove whether or not um, our solar system, which has obviously more than three bodies in it, is stable. Will it just continue ticking like it seems to be till the end of time? Now, there are certainly ways to set up three bodies. Um, you can get, set them up very nicely such that they just do ellipses around each other and the whole thing will keep on ticking till the end of time. But this system is so sensitive to a small change that if I change the system a little bit and make one of the planets um, a slightly different size, so I've got three planets again, but just a very small perturbation in the beginning of set, initial settings can cause the planets just to fly off. They seem stable, and then after a certain time, they just fly off into outer space. You really don't want to be living in this solar system. Um, uh, what Poincaré discovered, actually he made a mistake. He thought he understood how to prove whether a system is stable. And then one of the referees asked, but how, why can you make this little approximation here? You say that we can sort of basically round up the, de the decimal places and it won't have too much effect on the outcome. And he began to think about it. And, and after a while he realized, he'd been given the prize already by the king, um, he realized he'd made a huge mistake. The paper, he tried to get the paper back from the publishers, um, but they'd already been gone out. He had to spend all of his prize money um, getting people to go out and recover this paper because he realized he'd made a huge mistake. But this huge mistake actually led on to the discovery that a lot of systems have this quality that you can't round up a little bit that if you have just a very small change in the initial conditions, these deterministic equations, no randomness in them at all, will just take the system off in a completely different direction. Again, our intuition, I think, is about, you make a small change, you shouldn't really uh, change the outcome too much. If I'm playing billiards, for example, or pool, or snooker, I've got a rectangular-shaped table, I shoot off a billiard ball, it flies around the table. If I shoot a billiard ball off in the same direction, I I'm not going to get it exactly right, but the billiard ball table has the property that, yeah, the, if I shoot off pretty much the same direction, the ball is going to end up pretty much in the same place. This is something which doesn't have chaos in it. But if I change the shape of the table, and I take uh, straight sides but have semicircular ends, kind of intriguing, this is my proposition for a new sort of uh, Olympic sport, is to have one of these tables, because now this has chaos hidden inside it. Because if I do the same thing, I shoot a billiard ball off on this si sort of table, and then I do another ball off at, a, uh, at what I think is at exactly the same angle, well, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but this very small change very quickly results in a completely different trajectory happening. And this is the signature of chaos. If you've got a system which has this sensitivity to initial conditions, then it becomes very hard to make any predictions at all based on any of the data that you have up to that point. You'll never have complete knowledge, and not having complete knowledge can have a devastating effect on being able to know where the system is going to end up. Now, one of my favorite examples of um, a chaotic system is actually a, a pendulum. Now, a, a pendulum, very interestingly, of course, is so regular that Galileo realized we could use it to keep track of time. But if I change a pendulum just very slightly, and I've got it here, what, uh, is, a, a, what, what is called a double pendulum. Um, so a double pendulum, uh, it, it's like a, a knee, so I've got a, a, two pieces um, uh, with this kind of connection here. Uh, and I'm going to do it here. Now, unfortunately, I don't think everyone's going to be able to see this. If you want to stand up, um, you can. Or if you want to come um, at the end and have a play with this, uh, I'm very welcome. But uh, um, let me show you. This thing sh seems incredibly simple. It's just got two pieces of metal connected together. And if I set it uh, going off, um, then to be able to predict that it's going to do this, swinging around, even to predict which way it's going to go around next, is almost impossible mathematically. Um, this is such a simple system, I can write down the equations for it, there's no problem about describing the mathematics here, but being able to predict it seems to have finished here. Let me try and repeat that. Here I'm going to try and start it at the same angle, and yet um, this time it's really doing a completely different behavior entirely. And if I try to replicate um, any of the particular ways that this... Oh, it's still going, gosh. There you go, one last one. Oh, go on. Oh, there. 
Oh, they're unbelievable. It seems to have gone... Uh, this is my favourite desktop toy. I can play with this thing for hours. Um, uh, if you want one, I, I bought it on chaoticpendulums.com, which I get no commission for, but really, it's a... Let, let's do one last one, and um, uh, you can come up and have a, a play with this at the end as well, if you want. So, but I, I think it's very striking that, um, you know, to be able to make any predictions about this, despite the thing being reasonably simple, just two bits of straight metal. I mean, you would think this is a kind of, um, f wow, first year physics, uh, but um, not at all. We really don't understand this at all. One last one. Is this going to go? There, I think it's uh, run its course. Um, and, and this is uh, the intriguing thing. So for the solar system as well, um, we, it, it is a system which is so sensitive that small changes. So actually, there's been an analysis done of um, our solar system. I mean, is our solar system stable? Um, maybe we're on a billiard table which is rectangular, or maybe we're in a billiard table which has got curved ends on the side. And it's, uh, there have been computer models run which show that the... the uh, I, I'm intrigued. Uh, if I had to choose a planet, which planet do you think is the one that would cause most problems to our solar system? Um, hands up if you think it's a, a one of the big planets, like Saturn or Jupiter. Um, I think that would be my intuition, is that... Um, what about a, a tiny planet like Venus or Mercury? Anyone? Yeah, the intriguing thing is that Mercury, the smallest of the planets, um, actually is believed to be the one which could cause our, our solar system to suddenly go into a chaotic mess and fly apart like this one does. Um, because there are certain resonances with Jupiter um, where suddenly this, the path of uh, Mercury stops uh, being as nice as it is now. It starts intersecting with Venus's um, trajectory. And then is, there's a chance that uh, it could actually knock Venus out and then was totally destabilise the whole solar system. Um, it's, it's calculated, I think, if, there's a 5% chance that that will happen. Not in our lifetimes, so you'll be happy to hear, but, um, but still quite significant that um, there is a, a model for how our solar system might fly apart. Now, the, this chaotic pendulum, I think, is interesting. There's another desktop toy which illustrates, again, um, the importance of knowing when you're in a chaotic system or not. Um, some of you may know this thing. It's a little... You have a pendulum and three magnets, and the pendulum swings, swings between the magnets and, after a while, stabilises at one of the magnets. Um, so here I've got a yellow, red and blue magnet. Um, and here's a, 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 so a, a few... Um, trajectories that I tried out, a computer simulation of these. Um, so I started them at pretty much at the same position, but I just altered a very small decimal place in, in one of the positions. And it had a dramatic effect on the outcome. Um, here I started here, the first uh, little model I ran, it went to the blue magnet, the second one it went to the red magnet, and the third one, just a very small change again in the initial conditions, it went to the yellow magnet. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult. You will never have enough information, the decimal places, to know quite which magnet this is going to go to. And here's a computer graphic which shows um, you the quality of the predictions that you can make in this particular system. Because clearly there are regions which are very predictable. If I'm very near to a red magnet and I let the uh, pendulum off, it's going to be attracted to that red magnet. There's nothing I can do to kick it out. But there are other regions here where um, this is actually an example of something called a fractal. So, of course, fractals are very important. Actually, fractals were discovered partly by looking at the markets and realising this sort of scale invariance. And this has this scale invariance. If I zoom in on this uh, uh, fractal region of this picture, uh, it doesn't get simple. The complexity remains, which means that if I start the magnet off in that top left-hand region, then just a very small change can take it from... So, so the, the picture shows you if I start over a yellow region, the pendulum will end up at the yellow magnet. If I start it over a red region, it ends at a red magnet. There are regions here which are big and yellow and very predictable, but there are other regions where just a small change will take me from yellow to red to yellow to red to blue and just uh, you know, a very small decimal place will mean that I end up somewhere completely different. Um, and this is, of course, something called the butterfly effect. So the butterfly effect means that uh, the weather is another chaotic system. I can make a small change in the weather, um, and that can have a massive effect on the outcome. So it could be a beautiful day here, and then suddenly a hurricane will kick in because a butterfly has flapped its wings in Brazil. Um, 
now, we've called this the DNA of the markets. Now, I, I think that what's interesting is that chaos is actually all over um, anything in the natural world and perhaps in the markets too. And one of the interesting places is in population dynamics. So I want to just show you a little model where um, uh, the interaction between mathematics and biology, uh, we, we've, we've sort of started this conference by saying the connections of the markets with biology. I think the trend now in science is this interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary nature that mathematics is feeding very much into biology. So, for example, there's a, a species which is, um, the story goes that every four years this species um, uh, kind of dies out because they believed it throws itself over a cliff um, in a kind of mass suicide pact. So I've got a little test for you. Um, wh which animal do you think it is that throws itself over a cliff in a mass suicide pact? So any votes for muskrats? Do you think it's the muskrats that throw themselves over? No one going for muskrats. Anyone think voles are the ones that go over the cliff every four years? A vote for voles down here, but a, a, a lone vole. Um, who thinks lemmings go over the cliffs every four years? Um, lots of hands going up. Yes, people say, oh, his hand went up. I thought I had Yes, you're all acting like lemmings, of course. And, uh, no, so absolutely right. The lemmings are the species that it was believed that every four years, well, actually not believed, the evidence came that every four years the population plummets. And we had to come up with a model. Why every four years are the lemmings just disappearing? And this theory came up that they were throwing themselves over a cliff. And this seemed to be proved when Walt Disney went out and filmed in the Arctic uh, lemmings in, uh, in their natural environment. And in the, they used to, you, some of you are old enough like me to, to have watched Walt Disney uh, nature programs. I don't think they make them now. But they used to go out and make these wonderful nature programs. So in this one white wilderness, the film crew went out and they discovered lemmings in the wild um, absolutely coming to the side of a cliff uh, looking over the side, and then for some strange reason, um, thinking, well, you know, don't go over there, I would think. But um, no, these lemmings, they, they look at the side and they start throwing themselves over the cliff. And this footage that seemed to have been gathered by the Walt Disney crew um, seemed to confirm that the lemmings seem to have this very strange behavior that they just follow everyone else. And as soon as one starts going over, now, I mean, there's one of them that seems quite clever and says, oh, I'm not going at all. But eventually, uh, no, he goes as well. Um, uh, a few years ago, the cameraman who filmed this sequence came clean. Those lemmings did not want to go over that cliff. In fact, the film crew had set up this spinning wheel, which you can't see, it's off camera, and there were production crew putting lemmings on the spinning wheel, and they were being shot off over the cliff into the water. Um, so suddenly this explanation for why this plummet in the, in the population had disappeared. So we had to come up with another reason. What was it that every four years was killing these lemmings? Uh, it turned out to be mathematics. Mathematics was responsible for these lemmings disappearing every four years, which is something I think my kids would probably agree with. Yeah, mathematics is incredibly deadly, Daddy. Um, but no, there's a mathematical formula which actually controls the population dynamics from one year to another. Now, I'm going to make just a simple version of this to illustrate this. Um, but in, the, in this model, what I'm going to do is basically the lemmings are going to double every season. But there's not going to be enough resources for all the lemmings to survive. So there's going to be a kind of feedback equation. So the number of lemmings that will not survive from one season to the next will be be, you'll take the previous generation, multiply it by the current, divide by 10, uh, and that will give you the number of lemmings that will die. So if we run this model and we take two lemmings to kick off with, need two lemmings to get a species going, um, so they double up to four, but then we use this model two times four, eight, divide by 10, so roughly one will not survive, so we get three that survive to the next generation. We keep going with this formula, three doubles up to six, not all will survive, how many don't? Three times six, 18, divide by 10, I get two that die. So suddenly I've got four left. I feed four in and it's growing again. Four doubles up to eight, four times eight, 32, divide by 10, I've got three that die. So now I've got five. But now with this equation, something interesting happens because with this population and this growth pattern, the population stabilizes. So I put five in, doubles up to 10, five times 10 is 50, divide by 10, five die, I've got five left. And suddenly the feedback stops and we've got this constant graph. So when the population is doubling, I get this stability happening. But what's interesting with this model, this recursive feedback model, is that if I make the, the lemmings a little bit more productive, let's make them uh, triple each season, and we'll feed in two again, what happens now? Well, two multiply up to six, um, they're tripling each season, uh, do the formula, one dies and they get five surviving. If I feed five in, the equation gives me eight that survive, but now I get a ping-ponging between five and eight. And we get stability again, but it's not 
constant, but it just ping-pongs between two values, a high value and a low value. If I tweak the equation again and take it up to 3.5, so that's the amount of multiplicity going on, this is the one that seems to happen in the Arctic. So um, population seems to, uh, to increase by a factor of 3.5. And when you put this feedback equation in, again, we get a pattern emerging, and every four years, the population plummets. And this seems to be, this equation is what's responsible for the pattern of population dynamics in these um, lemmings. But the most intriguing thing is when you push the equation a little bit further. Now let's make the lemmings incredibly productive and multiply at a rate of four per generation. Suddenly the pattern disappears and we get chaos emerging. There's a, a threshold moment where if you take the number up and the, multiply, and the multiplicity increases, there's a moment when suddenly you get no control on when the next generation will be. This thing is ping-ponging around and suddenly plummets, stays low for a while. And this is so sensitive that if I put one more lemming into the equation, um, then the graph will do something completely different. So it's very important, and this is the message I want you to take away from this, is that in any system, there will be regions when you know you can make predictions. But what's even more important, and what mathematics can help you to do, is that there are regions when you say, look, at this point, we cannot tell what is going to happen next, because we're in a chaotic region which has this amount of sensitivity that we will never know the amount of data. But knowing when you can't know something is often as important as knowing when you can make predictions. But you can t put this to your advantage, actually. And it was, uh, there was an amazing uh, example where Roberto Carlos from Brazil um, puts the advan uh, knowledge about the switch from chaotic behavior to regular behavior to amazing effect in the following free kick that he took against France. Um, so this is a few years ago. Roberto Carlos miles out. Bartes has put a wall up, but he doesn't think the ball is going to get anywhere near the net. And suddenly, from that distance, he gets the ball in the net. Let me show you another perspective on this, which shows you quite how amazing this free kick is. Look at how far that ball is going away from the goal. And then suddenly, at the last minute, it swings in, and you get the goal. This is the best one, because you can see people ducking um, in the crowd. They think it's going to hit them, and then right at the last minute. This is an example of Roberto Carlos realizing the importance of the change from chaotic behavior to regular behavior. Clearly a great mathematician, um, because what happens with a football is the turbulence behind a football above a certain speed is chaotic, and it has a very different behavior, and chaotic turbulence doesn't cause much drag on a football. So the ball flies through the air. If any of you play golf, you actually t take advantage of this. Flies through the air as if somebody's holding it. It doesn't seem to drop, a drop at all. And then uh, suddenly, at the last minute, the, the speed changes and the turbulence changes from chaotic to regular turbulence. And at that point, it's like a, a huge, great brake being put on the ball, and it slows to a, a halt, at which point the spin takes effect. And that's when it can suddenly swing into the back of the net, and you score that goal. The equations behind this football are another of our great unsolved problems. They're called the Navier-Stokes equations, um, and they're equations that describe um, turbulence in many situations. But as mathematicians, we do not know how to solve these. Obviously, um, Roberto Carlos has got some access um, to some hidden mathematical knowledge which he's not telling us about. Um, uh, but I think uh, what I hope you'll take away from this is that uh, mathematics is an incredibly powerful language to make predictions into the future when you can spot these patterns. You have to be careful because patterns can go in unexpected directions, one of the fun things about my subject. But even when something is random, we've managed to understand how we can make predictions on randomness. But I think the most exciting area is this area of chaos, which seems to describe so much of the natural world, where at times you can make predictions because you'll know you're in a region where you're playing on a rectangular billiard table. But it's very important to know when you're playing billiards on one that is going to cause completely different tra trajectories to happen. Thank you. Thank you. We've got some time for questions, um, but we do have micro roaming microphones. So if you do want to ask Marcus a question, please put your hand up, and then the microphones will come to you. Anyone got any questions for Marcus? So maybe the obvious question is, have you applied this to stock markets? Well, I personally, I'm one of these mathematicians who um, do mathematics for aesthetic reasons, in a way, not to make money. Um, so I spend a lot of my time working on things like prime numbers. And, uh, but I, uh, the point is that many of the people that I teach 
uh, I, I then go on and say, uh, well, no, I want to apply these methods. Um, so a lot of my colleagues, that are uh, students that I teach in Oxford, um, have gone off uh, to hedge funds. And I think at the heart of hedge fund is, is that ability to be able to match up um, probabilistic models against what's happening in the markets. But um, uh, so I, I, what I hope to illustrate today is just the tools that we have uh, at our um, fingertips to be able to, to, to read different natural situa situations, and certainly I think they should be. Um, but it's interesting. I, I'm, uh, I, I think that uh, in some ways mathematicians, you know, I think it's important you have mathematicians uh, on, on your books in a way, um, but also mathematicians are perhaps not always the best. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's a collaboration because mathematicians tend to like models which are incredibly predictable and of course the markets have uh, a lot of uncertainty in them and, and that's I think, uh, I think why physics in some sense, um, the physicists are the ones that were, were actually better adapted as a species. Um, to being able to be thrown into this uh, system and, and to deal with uncertainty. Whilst mathematicians actually, um, they're very addicted to models um, where they uh, can make predictions. Um, uh, so, uh, but, but, but the point is that we have incredible tools to be able to, to make, things, uh, make predictions when the things uh, do have a, a model behind them. So no, I'm not, uh, I haven't applied these um, so, uh, and retired or anything on my <laughs> winnings. But, uh, Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, how do prime numbers match up in nature in terms of occurrence against the Bernacci numbers? And then, if I got a prime number that is also Fibonacci, is it really more powerful? Right, very good question. Um, uh, there's, uh, you had a little game that you played <coughs> moving you around tables uh, this morning, um, a little algorithm that made sure that you didn't share a table with somebody um, uh, that you'd already been with. Um, and I had a little discussion, what, what was the algorithm? I looked at my little tag and saw, made some predictions about what I thought was at the heart of this. And sure enough, in, actually what was being used was properties of prime numbers to keep things out of sync. So you can produce very good algorithms for making sure that things don't uh, repeat by using primes. And this is a very interesting example in nature of a, a, a particular insect using this for their evolutionary survival. So uh, if anyone here from North America on the East Coast, you'll probably have encountered these cicadas that appear every 17 years. So they stay underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. And then after 17, they appear in the forest, millions of these things party away, and then the, they lay eggs to the next generation, which doesn't appear for another 17 years. Now, it's very curious, why do they have these 17-year um, cycle? There's another species which has a 13-year cycle, but you never find 12, 14, 15, 16, or 18. They, they don't exist in, uh, the, the, in North America. And the belief is that there was a predator that used to appear periodically in the forest, and it used to try and time its arrival to coincide with a cicada. So, if, for example, if you had a predator which appears every six years, and you have a cicada appearing every nine years, well, they get in sync too quickly, because year, every 18th year, they're together. But if you make the cicada appear every seven years, so seven years, it's appearing more often in the forest. You might think it's more uh, open to attack. But no, six and seven are now, um, you know, seven's prime. You won't see uh, a coincidence until year 42. And so this is a very important role that primes play, that they manage to keep things out of sync. And there's a beautiful, one of my favorite uh, composers is Olivier Messiaen, a French composer, who wrote this beautiful piece called The Quartet for the End of Time. And he uses this same idea of keeping things out of sync in the composition of the piano part to that piece of music. So the piano part has a rhythm sequence, which is 17 note rhythm sequence, which just repeats and repeats. But the harmonic sequence is 29 chords which repeat and repeat. But the 17 and 29 keep things out of sync such that you never hear the same thing twice. And you, get, you can hear pattern inside there. You know this structure because there's something seems to be repeating, but you're never quite sure what it is because these things keep out of sync. And so I think they're primes, you know, that primes are used, for example, in a, a concert halls for acoustics because you don't want things, um, uh, sound waves sort of building up on each other and resonating. So what I'd be interested in, I mean, I, I talked earlier to somebody who said, yeah, we did look at the markets and see whether, you know, is there any sort of primeness happening in the, in the markets, in prime numbers sort of uh, in this. Um, well, there, there could be, there could be sort of uh, an 
inbuilt sort of uh, things rather like the evolutionary cicadas, which say, no, I want to keep out of sync of something in order to be able to, to not have this resonance happening. Um, so you said about the Fibonacci numbers. Well, one of the big open problems, which um, if anyone can solve here, they will become a famous mathematician, is are there infinitely many Fibonacci numbers that are prime numbers? We don't know that. Um, it's, a, it's an unknown fact, but we believe it's probably true. Um, but uh, you know whether there's any extra power when a, a Fibonacci number is, is prime or not, I, I, I don't know of any sort of extra significance to that. But it's a kind of interesting open problem for me as a number theorist. Um, uh, the, when you look at these two sequences, do they infinitely often interact with each other? We'll make this the last question. Yeah. There's a chance, of course, this afternoon as well to ask some questions. So. Um, would, would you agree with the idea that markets are far more risky than people perceive them to be, i.e. Um, black swan events are far more common in market behavior than most people would think? <coughs> uh, I always use the example of the Monty Hall problem probability where often when I meet graduates or interns and I give them that very simple solution of free choices and the doors, um, and quite often they get it wrong. And it really highlights to me that people don't understand the nature of risk very yeah. well. Yeah, I think the, the, the Monty Hall problem is a, a great example of uh, just how counterintuitive um, probabilities are. And that's, you know, we're having to negotiate life doing that all the time. We have incomplete information, many possibilities, and we need to assess which one we're going to choose. And, uh, you know, the, the role of psychology obviously is an important extra ingredient into this. The Monty Hall, it, it's actually, you know, it's interesting because it's not about a huge amount of data in a way. Um, the Monty Hall problem, if anybody doesn't know it, is the, the game show you're shown three doors. Uh, the game show host asks you to choose a door. Um, there's two goats and one car behind the doors. You choose a door and he opens one of the other doors that you haven't chosen to reveal a goat and then asks you, do you want to change your mind now and move to the other door or are you going to stick with your in initial choice? And of course, our intuition is, well, it's 50-50 now. It doesn't really make any difference. I'll kick myself if I change. So intriguingly, most people stick. But actually, you double your chances by moving to the other door because actually you've been given new information which you, uh, you don't realise perhaps at first sight because the game show host will not open a door randomly. There isn't a chance that he showed you the car. Intriguingly, the whole thing changes if somebody else is randomly choosing and chose the goat. If there was a possibility of a car, it is now 50-50. So it looks like the same amount of information. But, um, so it's very important in navigating these things that you don't follow your intuition. Actually, I often use large numbers as a way to um, illustrate that problem. If you have a million doors, you choose one, I open all of them except another one, well, you're going to move now, aren't you? Because, you know, I know where the car is. I've opened every other door except your door and this other door. Well, now I think you'll move. So sometimes large numbers can help you in, with your intuition, um, uh, with knowing when you're going to change. And I think the black swan e example is intriguing because I think that is the illustration of um, the, the chaos a a actually at the heart of this because this, the ability, uh, the, this kind of scaling factor, that there is infinite complexity in, in the sort of data um, is illustrative of the fact that um, you know, you, you're, you've not got this kind of regular behaviour. You will start to see spikes um, as, as, as deep as you want to go. Well, we've run out of time for this session, but I'd like to thank Marcus for a, a totally stimulating, enjoyable and very interesting presentation. He didn't talk about the markets at all, but I think we, can all, we, would, all, we, we would all have been sitting there thinking and realising how aligned mathematics is to the markets, down to things like patterns, Numerous things you talked about. I thought, yes, that's the markets. That's that was my hope. Yes. <laughs> my, um, and I also wish that more maths teachers weren't like Marcus. I know I would have studied maths a lot more if I'd had a teacher who was passionate and enthusiastic about the subject. If of I maths. had a pound for every time somebody said that, I, I, I wouldn't need to play the markets. So, uh. <laughs> All the lottery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he will be around for the rest of the day, and he's uh, on the panel this afternoon talking about understanding risk. But thank you very much, Marcus, and a small gift. An appreciation. Oh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much.